welcome to the seventh Manhattan tutorial on functions and macros. Previously, we created blocks of code capable of more flexible and complex musical processes, which can be reused either by way of the clipboard or the dot run mechanism. In this tutorial, instead of placing the code in the pattern directly, we enter it outside the music, in slots designated for useful code that we envisage using in multiple places or situations. This represents one of the most powerful concepts in programming, defining functions. In both programming and music, it is common to repeat elements or processes. Functions allow you to write the code once, and then use it again and again. But unlike the dot run mechanism, can also adapt to different situations through the use of input arguments. Functions, also known in Manhattan as macros, can be edited using the macro editor, which is opened using control, shift, equals. As in the last tutorial, you will again be presented with a single text box for your code but now have 10 numbered effects, 0xy to 9xy, that can each contain a different code block or macro that can be called from any part of the pattern. In this tutorial, a number of examples have been provided for you, 0xy to 4xy. To move between them, press the Tab key and Shift Tab key. In the first slot, 0xy, you will find the code from the previous tutorial. If you play the pattern from the start, you will notice that the code is applied every time there is a 0xy effect in the cell hosting it. Press escape to exit the macro editor and play the pattern. Let's move to step 2 and explore the first function. At the moment, this code does the same thing every time. It goes two steps into the future and sets that pitch to the current pitch plus seven semitones. Like pattern effects seen previously, such as at xx for setting tempo or sty to affect a note delay, each macro takes one or two input values known as arguments. By using arguments, we can vary its behavior, making it more flexible and useful in a wider range of situations. There are two ways to use them. You can either use each digit as a separate argument, x and y, each from 0 to f, or 0 to 15 in hex, or combine them both to be a single argument, referred to as xy, or if you prefer, xx. This single argument goes from 0, 0 to ff, which is 0 to 255 in hex, and therefore gives you a bigger range. In your macro code, you simply write x, y, and xy as variables instead of fixed numbers, and they will assume the values you've passed from the pattern when the macro is used. In this first example, we will extend the code from the code blocks tutorial by using arguments to vary its behavior. We will use the two arguments x and y to respectively vary how far ahead we change the pitch and how many semitones are added to the current pitch. We do this by replacing the fixed digits in the current code with our arguments. Instead of two, we write x, and instead of seven, we use y. If we now escape back to the pattern, and play the music, the arguments now control the timing and transposition of the added notes. Now I can change the behavior of the code without altering the code itself, simply by changing the effect parameters. This simple example demonstrates the basic use of functions and arguments. To write code once, then use it again and again in different places. We now move to step three, where we'll explore the other four functions provided in the pattern and associated musical examples. The goal of coding is to elegantly represent a process we can use multiple times in different places, generating different results based on different inputs. Abstracting processes, for example, into macros or functions, reduces the complexity of systems in both music and software, making it easier to understand, create, and explore the bigger picture. Instead of editing individual pitches, a function might allow you to explore families of different melodies, harmonies, rhythms, and so on. This tutorial invites you to explore the rest of the functions provided here, numbers one to four. The functions are presented in the macro editor and in separate bars of music in the pattern, which illustrate possible use.
If you're working your way through this tutorial, you might want to pause this video and see if you can decipher what each of the functions is used for. When you think you know what's going on, you can click the links in the tutorial text to get an explanation of how the function works. In this video tutorial, we will now explore each of these functions. Let's move to the second bar and explore 1xy. 1xy is a simple harmonizer. This macro function takes the current pitch, that is where the effect is used, and creates two additional notes in the next two channels to form a chord, transposed by x and y semitones respectively. For example, an xy pair of 3-7 produces a minor triad, 3 semitones and 7 semitones from the provided pitch, whilst a 4-7 would produce a major triad. The code for the macro specifies the pitches for the neighbouring cells in one and two channels to the right of the current cell. To address this cell, we use the plus one and plus two notation, but because we're addressing channels, we put them before the colon. Because we have not specified anything after the colon, which would refer to the row, it defaults to the current row. And so this gives us an easy way to address neighbouring pitches, which are useful for things like building chords. The two lines specify two neighbouring pitches, one x semitones higher than the current pitch, and one y semitones higher than the current pitch. If I press escape and listen to the bar, this is what it sounds like. This simple bit of code gives us a mechanism of interacting with harmony instead of individual notes. For example, if I wanted to change the first minor chord to a major chord, all I now have to do is cursor over to the 3-7 and change it to a 4-7. Let's now move on to the third bar and function 2xy. We often want to be able to predict and carefully control what code does to meet a well-defined purpose, but we can also, especially in music and art, sometimes leave variation to chance. For example, when there are a range of alternatives as good as each other, or when we don't know what we want and we're looking for something new. The 2xy macro function is a simple volume randomizer. This macro takes one double digit parameter xy and varies the volume of the cell by a random value between zero and xy. Such a function could, for example, be used to define a rough volume sequence as effect parameters, but introduce a random, perhaps more humanistic element to the final performance. This is what it sounds like. An argument of 4-0 in hex translates to a decimal of 64, the maximum volume, and so the rows with 4-0 have the chance of being the maximum volume. However, the rows that are 1-0 are capped at 16. We therefore retain some control over the rhythmic emphasis, but allow some deviation from it as well. Now let's move to the final bar. This bar illustrates a more complex example of functions, and uses two together. In channel 2, we have a series of pitches that have been entered, which are then processed by the function 3xy. This has the effect of using these pitches to populate the next three channels, which are then subject to the 4xy macro, which decides what to do with these pitches. Before we explore what each function does, let's listen to what they generate. In combination, these two macros generate a more complex musical pattern. To make it easier to explore each of them, we'll go into the macro editor and disable the 4xy function. We do this by taking the line of code and adding the comment symbol before it, 
The computer will now treat it as a comment rather than code and therefore it won't be executed. Using comments in this way is a very useful debugging technique in all forms of programming. Now we can focus on what 3xy is doing. If we look at the code, we can see that it's very similar to the simple harmonizer we saw in 1xy. It specifies pitches for the next three channels. Each takes the last pitch that appears in channel 2 and copies it to the channel, while transposing the last two up an octave. Let's listen to this bar with only the 3xy function enabled. If we look in channels 3 to 5, we see that each row assumes the previous pitch in channel 2. This provides the palette for the 4xy function. Let us uncomment the code and consider its function. The two lines use conditional statements previously seen in tutorial 5, but with a slight twist. This last macro exploits a unique feature of Manhattan that supports probabilistic conditional statements. In computing, zero is typically false and all other values, notably including one, are true. In Manhattan, a condition that results in a value between zero and one becomes a probability of it being true, ranging from zero and zero chance, i.e. always false, to one, 100% 1 chance, and always true. For example, if the condition before the question mark evaluates to 0.5, it would have half a chance of being true and half a chance of being false. Consider first the second line here. The condition is 0.1, therefore there is a 10% chance of it being true, and thus a 10% chance of dot pitch being set to a note off. Therefore one time in 10, the current note will be ended. Now consider the first line. This works on a similar basis, but it decides how likely it is that the current pitch will be changed by the Y parameter and specifically it will use the x parameter to decide how likely this is to happen. The x parameter on its own can go from 0 to f in hex, which is 0 to 15. Therefore the range of fractions for this condition range from 0 out of 15 to 15 out of 15. That is, never to always and everything in between depending on what x is. If we look at the values that are used in the cells themselves, we can see that sometimes this is a high number C, for example, or F, which is very likely to change the pitch. Sometimes it's a very low number, and so the pitch is very unlikely to change. Let's listen to these two functions in combination. The y arguments in channels 3, 4, and 5 are respectively 0, 3, and 7, and therefore if a note survives, it will either preserve the current pitch, raise it by 3 semitones, or raise it by 7 semitones, depending on the channel. And then the x argument is deciding how likely it is that we'll do this transposition. All the time, we have that 10% chance that we'll simply put a note off command in there. And if you look at this little space, you'll notice that roughly 10% of the cells have the note off command. The result is a generative musical texture on harp and strings based on a minor tonality that would not be out of place on a TV crime drama. But this process would be even more useful in a video game where we can't write the music in advance because we don't know what the player's actions and pace will be. And so the ability to generate music on the fly for as long as we need is particularly useful. Before continuing to the next tutorial, spend a little time coming up with a few of your own functions in the remaining slots 5xy to 9xy. Feel free to work with the existing content of the pattern, or venture into new channels, muting or unmuting as appropriate, or you can clear the pattern and simply write your own functions and music from scratch. This concludes the seventh tutorial, which shows you the basic use of functions and macros.
it has also demonstrated how just a few simple functions can be combined together to produce complex musical outputs.